And here we are, Defense Entrepreneurs Forum 2021, our final keynote speaker with one of my favorite humans in the entire universe, Dr. Beam Mao. So um, I feel like I don't have to introduce him, but uh, it is my job and my pleasure to introduce him. So I really uh, cannot wait to share with you guys uh, just really some of the most awesome wisdom set in dragon land. We'll, we'll get to that later. But Dr. B. Mao, one of the uh, founders and leaders of AFWorks from 2017 to 2020, and most recently a best-selling author for the experiment that succeeded, how a government startup beat Amazon, leveraged innovation history and changed Air Force culture. Uh, found out today that was not actually the title it was supposed to be. It was going to be Juggling Chainsaws While Walking Tightropes, which uh, helps me to understand a lot about innovation and just really welcoming uh, Beam, a person that I know who has changed culture, has changed innovation, and has changed people's lives around uh, the national security community and beyond. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Beam to the stage and to talk about slaying the uncertainty dragon during innovation jousts. Good sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Trish, and good afternoon to death. Good afternoon, defenders. Today, I want to leave you with four potential solutions, at least four, because people fear the unknown. People fear the uncertain. So the goal of today's gathering is to leave you with at least four good stories that you can offer people and turn around and say, aha, this is why we take on innovation the way we do. Because wouldn't it be great if, you know, oh, I have to slay a dragon today. That would be awesome if you actually saw the dragon, knew the dragon's weakness, knew what you could train and do, and boom, it's going to happen. Because everybody here who's gathering for a deaf meeting, you're the type of people that'll get it done. The biggest issue we have is that we don't know what that is. There's so much uncertainty that can pop up in any given day that that's really where the challenge is. So the goal of today is to show you that not only that government can be innovative, for those of you who I haven't met yet from AFWorks, our Air Force mission, we went from being a Pentagon idea in 2017 to being ranked number 16 in the world, two slots ahead of, of Amazon, as a best workplace for innovators. This is by the annual Fast Company Review, 865 organizations that year. So number one, I wanna leave you with the message that it is possible. If you've had some challenges, it is possible. And there are challenges along the way, but here's some ways based upon my experiences in the Pentagon, on the front lines and in larger conversations, here's some examples that you can take good water cooler conversation so that if you either have a stakeholder who's a resource provider, a senior leader, or just someone who's like, well, why would we wanna be innovative? Isn't that like, oh, I don't know, that's the cliche, that's the buzzword, we're past it. No, actually we're not. We're, why are we here today? We are here today because there is a great global competition occurring as we stand together today. One of the easiest ways to understand it is you can't say, let me give organization A a creative culture and organization A a placebo, and let's see what the difference is in six months. Or there, there's no such way to do that. But what there is in history are a series of examples that show us that the creative culture beats the authoritarian culture. One of these, the ones that you can do right now, you can look up on your web browser, North Korea, South Korea at night, and you will see a picture similar to what you see right now. Basically, what we have is war-torn Korean Peninsula after World War II gets divided in half. In the North, we've got authoritarian command and control from the Soviet Union, from the communists, including from China now with support. And in the South, we have democratic, diverse, competitive thought and action. And the trick with this democratic, diverse, competitive thought and action is that it's, it's sloppy. It is uncertain. We're not sure exactly what's going to come out of it. So the short-term advantage in the North under these authoritarian regimes is we've got unity of effort. When we say your family can have one child, that's all you get. And if they change the policy to three, then now you can suddenly make a little more choice about family. But the unity of effort is intense within these authoritarian groups. And in the short term, that's so appealing. But who could have considered 75 years ago, over 75 years ago, 
when they were setting up the South Korean system, they, they said, you know, one day I predict 75 years from now, a world leader like LG Electronics will come from South Korea, or maybe Samsung, or maybe Hyundai, right? You just don't know. So that's an important thing when you're having your discussions with the leaders and they say, well, what is this effort going to bring me? The first answer is it's going to bring you an environment, picking the actual result a lot harder to predict, but that environment does bring positive results that over the long term, North Korea, South Korea, you can definitely see what that is. If you want to put a number to it, because some people like quantitative numbers, one way that you measure how innovative an organization or a nation is, is you say, well, how many patents did they turn out? How much unique intellectual property is coming out of this organization or this nation? And for that, we turn to the U.S. Patent Office 2020 data, and we see that there were four items in North Korea that were worthy of that unique distinction of a patent. Meanwhile, South Korea, 24,587 patents in 2020. So the evidence clearly shows within this grand experiment that the long-term advantage of a creative culture trumps the short-term appeal of authoritarian command and control. Repeat this in a much smaller sense with the 40-ish years of the Berlin Wall experiment. Again, World War II, war-torn city, broken up under two different cultures, two different structures. In the West, capitalism and that sloppy democratic thing. In the East, we have, again, the Soviet Union, authoritarian command and control. Each side puts their best resources at it. And after the Berlin fall, Wall falls, you can see, such as from books of Capitalism in America by uh, former federal chairman Alan Greenspan, you can see the, the statistics that show that the sloppy capitalism, democratic, diverse thought and action, which again is 180 degrees out from authoritarian command and control, sloppy, diverse, competitive thought and action, uncertain competitive thought and action, three times more productive, three times more prosperous than the communist authoritarian side. So it's against this great competition that we want to ask ourselves, well, if they each started out with the same basic ingredients of people and talent, and everybody wants to be motivated to do well, nobody wakes up and says, I hope I make my life worse than it was when today started. What's going on that we don't see? And this is where policy, culture, and some of the great speakers that we've had these last few days can add more color and more flavor. For my part, I just want to humbly offer that there are many paths to truth. And here's just a fun example of this for a water cooler conversation. In the lower left, the person at point A is saying, boy, if I want to get all the way up to the summit of truth, I need some sunscreen. I'm getting baked on by the sun here. Meanwhile, in the middle of the picture, the person at point B is like, sunscreen? Are you kidding me? I need an extra jacket. It's cold over here. It's all dark. So two different people pursuing the exact same objective, depending on where you're starting from, could be completely talking past each other. So patience is probably going to be important as we try and sort out different forms of uncertainty. Now, my apologies. I'm going to show you a couple of models because models are really nice, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It gives us a framework that we can then apply our specific examples to. But George Box in the left here is the one who said, essentially, you know, all models are wrong. Some are useful. And I would speak to you uh, first as, as a chess player, not a very good one. I'm, I'm very well aware that the bishop on the board can only move diagonally. But in reality, I'm also a Catholic. I, I've met bishops and I assure you, they don't just walk diagonally. They've got all sorts of different walks. So you don't say, well, chess isn't a very good thing because it doesn't match with reality. The bigger picture again, right, is that when we have a model or when we have a game, what is it trying to teach us from a larger strategic standpoint? And chess is really interesting. So if we go back, particularly my national defenders, if we go back to the Cold War and we ask ourselves which nation dominated the game of chess the most, we'd probably turn to the Soviet Union and Russia for the greatest chess leaders. And now think about that game. Chess starts off on the left with a full set of army facing the other army. And then largely through a series of moves, strategy moves, there's a lot of attrition that occurs so that you can finally hone in and get the other person's king. Mirror that metaphor against the Cold War. And there are Soviet speeches from the leaders that would say things like, if we were to lose all of the population but still have one third of the world's population left, if it were communist, that would be okay by me. And you're like, whoa, you know, the Cold War thought, the nuclear war thought, that mutual assured destruction nuclear thing that we were all worried about, it was 
really, you can link it back to the game. This is what victory means. Doesn't matter how much of the board gets obliterated, as long as at the end, I'm the one controlling all the capitals. That's a really interesting water cooler conversation, but it's also a very important metaphor to think about how a nation might think depending on the way that it plays its games. For contrast then, let's take a look at China where the game of Go, quite possibly 4,000 years old, one of the oldest games, if not the oldest game on the planet. Note the difference between a Go thinker versus a chess thinker. In the game of Go, you start off with a blank board. And then over time, the competing players try and pick out the way to control the territory on the board. And then by the end, there's a matchup and a scoring of who controls the most zones. Now, let's look at China's one belt, one road policy and look at that board that is Europe, Asia, Africa. You don't see obliteration, you see expansion, you see control through economic means, partially through military capability backing that up, but it's a very different mindset. And we, again, back to the water cooler, something interesting to say, we need to be aware, and somebody on your team probably should have some basic understanding of how people play chess, how people play Go, and how that might be affecting the mental models that they approach situations with. Because everybody might be pursuing truth, but if you've got different mental models, again, sunscreen versus shade, it can be hard to track that. And even more interesting, or at least as interesting to me from a historical standpoint is, if you look at soccer, which predates, I don't know, we could pick 1200, 1500, 1600. This is a really interesting, um, almost socialist type of, paradigm from Europe that comes to us because when you look at a soccer field that's as old as Europe, you see that most of the players do approximately the same thing. You can't use your hands, you can kick, and you can be in different positions, but everybody does approximately the same thing, which would make all the sense in the world since this game arrived before the Industrial Revolution and before Enlightenment took over in the 1700s and the 1800s. So with that in mind, then contrast that with American NFL football and see how very diverse because Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, 1776, an interesting date. Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations talked about how important it is to have a division of labor, to have specialization of labor. And now look at American NFL football. You've got running backs, you've got wide receivers. Some of them are really muscular and sub 200 pounds. Then you've got the big linemen out there. Those guys, 300, 350 pounds, you know, totally different skill sets. And then the game comes down to who can apply these diverse division of labor capabilities to most effectively score the most points. So really interesting mental models that we can see within national games that might be worth reflecting on. Now, if the best games that we ever saw from chess or Go were from those nations, such as the Soviet Union, Russia, or from China, or from Korea with Go, here's an interesting thought about the West. In our advancement of artificial intelligence, in our attempts to reduce uncertainty by having a computer helper with us, with Deep Blue, they were able to defeat the world champion for the first time using just brute force calculations of, I bet I can predict everything that happens on an eight by eight board with these confined rules. Again, then later on, AlphaGo, and it does take nearly 20 years to come up with a new way of thinking because a Go board at 19 by 19 on their grid, billions of combinations, no computer's going to outsmart that to the very end and back, it, not possible. But what the humans with the computer did to reduce uncertainty is they started taking areas of local optimization within different spots on the board. There's all sorts of little movies out there, totally worth looking at just to see a little bit more about AI and the way people can think and optimize. But again, the big picture here is, we were never the best at this consistently, but then the West develops the computers with the models that beats the nations at their best, at their best games. And that might be a worthy water cooler conversation to talk about for reducing uncertainty and being victorious. Now, the model I would like to leave you with, in addition to these stories, this is a model that was used while AFWorks was building up and growing during our startup years as we went from an idea to number 16 in the world. And it's important because I'm going to call it the factors linking organizational will, the flow model. It's important to distinguish this is not just about innovation anymore. 
This is about an innovation mission. Okay, and when you take it to the mission level, we're no longer talking just about the design thinking methods, agile, lean, whatever you want to approach. It's more than that, because now at the mission level, it is a political interaction between the innovatives and the non-innovative thinkers. And this does include the design methods, but also organizational alignments. And so by offering you some of these alignments, I hope that you can optimize your innovation efforts as you look at a larger mission. So what are the factors that link organizational will to success? The very first one is that before you were born, there was an environment for you or I or anyone else, right? There was an environment that had threats and opportunities. And we can go back to, again, Maslow, who says, if you're in the jungle, you gotta take care of your food, clothing and shelter first and rise up through safety to get to self-actualization. Or Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan, 1651. And he says, you know what? This civilization thing is kind of cool for the humans because life outside of civilization is, the famous five words, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And so for those reasons, because the jungle and just nature itself is pretty darn nasty, we come together. We come together as family, friends, large groups, organizations, nations. And we say, I want to defend my values from these threats. I want to defend my life from these threats. Or we form businesses, research centers, defense, military defense, because there are opportunities that we need to take care of and take advantage of when they arise for our particular missions. The next layer in within these factors linking organizational will, the flow model, is that within that environment then, something occurs that usually makes us form a mission and a strategy. Simple example. Uh, World War II kicks off for the United States because of Pearl Harbor. So a threat emerges from the environment. And so we form a mission. And when was the first major term use of United Nations? It actually goes back to World War II, not post-World War II with the building. But World War II, the Allies referred to themselves as the United Nations that would be fighting against the Axis powers. They had a mission, and that mission was the unconditional surrender of the Axis powers. So it wasn't, hey, you know, as soon as I get them out of my country, I'm done. I'm not going to risk my people. It's, no, we are all in this together until we have an unconditional surrender and this doesn't come back again. And now with that mission, well, how are you going to do it? And note the beauty in the quality of the simplicity of the strategy of the allies of the United Nations against the Axis power. Two words. It was two words that guided the Allies and the United Nations in their fight. And those two words were Europe first. And with that in mind, whether you were an infantryman on the beaches of Normandy or whether you were a chef out on the boat in the Pacific, you knew the first thing to do was take care of Hitler and then we could pivot our assets towards the Pacific and do what needed to be done there. But really amazing how there's an environment and whether it's by way of threat or a perceived opportunity, we then form groups nations, organizations, families even, with missions and strategies to try and advance and do better in life. So in that way, I'd like to leave the hint or the one of our secrets of success for AFWorks. How do you reduce uncertainty and get towards greater success? It does help to have that senior leader support. For AFWorks, back when we kicked off in 2017, part of it was exactly because our senior leaders at the time issued a simple one, again, simple, one page document that says during our tenure, the Air Force has five major priorities. Priority number three, drive innovation to secure our future. And so out of that, AFWorks was born, <laughs> truly born, because it then took me nine months, along with some co-authors, but I was the lead author on the right. You see the AFWorks charter, and it doesn't come around until about nine months later, we finally make it through all the coordination for four pages worth of paper. But still, uh, an official senior leader support endorsement chartered organization. So yeah, if you want to line up your will, if you're in the Pentagon and your environment includes senior leaders, probably good to have them on your side as you try and advance your mission. Now the broader mission that they gave us was, you know, secure the uncertain future. And you're like, oh, how do I do that? What's my strategy? The fun part here is you know in your heart already what that strategy is because you've lived it in a different metaphor when you first met a financial advisor or you asked your parents for advice, hey, 
hey, how do I how do I save for retirement? What, what's the thought out there? And the answer is largely the same way that you approach innovation. That is, you want to have, again, competitive, diverse thought and action. For your retirement, your financial advisor probably came back to you and you said, don't put all your eggs in one basket because you never know what could happen there. But instead, let's do some stocks, bonds, index funds. How about some real estate? Hey, I know some collectibles. We could get some precious metals in there. And there's whole range of stuff at different percentages because something could go wrong here, but it's good to know that you're going to have growth over there. Usually one kind of offsets the other. And overall, we've seen consistently that something like an S&P 500 index pretty much outperforms anything else, again, over the long term, not in the short term, over the long term compared to the, the day traders and stuff like that who can get hot for six months, even three years. But over that long term, you start putting in 10 years worth of time frame, the S&P 500 comes back with some amazing results. In the same way, AFWorks's approach towards innovation included how do we build out the ecosystem instead of putting all the pressure on those few defense industrial base manufacturers? Can we connect with DEF as it was coming up, Ensign, and the other works is like soft works that were out there. What can we do with our academic research partners, venture capital, which then, you know, Air Force Ventures came out of the AFWorks startup time. And so lots of different ways. But again, if it's competitive, diverse thought and action, how do you unite that to reduce the uncertainty of what's going to come out of there? The lower right corner is almost the entire basis of economics, which is you unite a decentralized ecosystem with information and with incentives. And you need to work out what that means from a prize or challenge uh, perspective, but that's there's a lot in those simple words that you see there. We move on. Let's talk a little bit about culture. Much like you don't really know what's under the hood of your vehicle. I mean, you, you probably have some idea what the engine size might be, but could you draw it freehand? You know, it's, it's very hard to structure that, but culture is the engine that moves your organization. And so same thing, what kind of culture, what deliberate culture are you trying to draw out or put together? And that's kind of important because uh, Peter Drucker famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And one of the greatest things out there, one of the greatest examples, again, water cooler conversation for you, is how important is culture? Let's look at Kodak. Steve Sasson, 1974 through 76, invents one of the first digital cameras within the Kodak labs. And he takes it back to management and he's like, I, I've got a digital camera. I think we could, we, you know, I need some work, but I mean, we, we can build on this. And management comes back with that classic, hey, uh, Steve, maybe you missed it, but Kodak was built on film, you know, and our history is what made us great. We don't need to change. We don't need to do that. Or even more fun, I like to imagine that somebody came back and said, what? A digital camera? Really? For a Kodak moment? What are you going to do? Combine that digital camera with our rotary phone? Next thing you know, you're going to put a record player on it. Yeah, a music phone camera. As if. 1970s thinking, right? So culture kind of matters. Now, at the same time, we need to be careful because note in the hierarchy, environment first, then mission and strategy, and then culture. Because depending on your strategy, a Wall Street firm, they fully expect their people are going to work that 80 to 100 hours a week. 10 years from now, they're probably leaving a millionaire if they're still alive, if you don't burn out. But that's very different from, well, even up here in northern Michigan where I am, a lot of people only want 40 hours a week go to the factory so that when they're done, they can do the hunting and fishing and other things that they want to do. And they're not looking for job fulfillment. They're looking for enough to pay their bills so they can live the lifestyle that they want. So really important that once you have your strategy and what you want to do, make lots of money or whatever, the culture that fits it, all right, we're going to be open so we can burn ourselves out and get, take advantage of all our daylight hours. It's an important match. But note the hierarchy again, because people say, you know, culture dominates strategy. Simple counter example is the blockbuster video example. Imagine we have a store manager and she is like the greatest manager, culture leader of all time. Her employees love her. They work overtime and they don't record it. People drive an extra 15 miles on, free, on new release Friday because somehow she's got the vision that, you know, I'm going to have enough stuff on the new release shelf so that the high school kids don't wipe it out at three o'clock and then I get there at five o'clock and I'm like, huh. No new releases. Okay, I'll go back to the Oscar aisle and I'll take that. Maybe by Sunday, there'll be some new stuff back and I, then I can watch the new release on Sunday instead of Friday. 
right? So she's incredible. But no matter how great she was with her culture and what she set up in store operations, because headquarters Blockbuster didn't think, oh, that streaming video stuff. Yeah, that's kind of important. No, they didn't. You know, hey, we were made great by people having the choice and being able to touch the product. As a result, the greatest culture leader at Blockbuster ended up unemployed, just like the rest of the Blockbuster folks, because streaming video and the environment ate them up. So yes, culture might eat strategy for breakfast, but if you're not paying attention within your organization, the environment will eat your strategy and your culture by brunch time. Which is why we should reflect on earlier quotes. Ludwig Wittgenstein, who said, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Can you imagine Kodak if they had said, you know what we are? We are a memory capture company. And then Steve Sasson uh, approaches them and he's like, I got a digital camera. And they're like, well, that's a unique way of doing memory capture. Let's look at that. But instead, you get this, Steve, we're a film-based company. Watch your language. I mean, truly watch your language. And we're not talking about profanity ratings here. Watch your language. Because we definitely, in AFWorks during our three years, the language out there and how it could be interpreted by the middle management group, the what's sometimes called the frozen middle, not all of it's frozen, but some of it certainly is, where you would go and you would say, hey, can we approach Congress and say, could we have some flexible funds? Because sometimes it's got to be this 3,400, 3,600, 3,080, and, and just hunting for the right kind of money to support an innovation project. It's killed us. We don't approach Congress and talk about money. It's, it's really controversial. There's a history behind that. And you're like, yeah, but in the 1970s, I get it. You had to track where did the R&D money go through paper logs and stuff. But isn't this the digital age? And wouldn't you be able to just link the money with what's already going over and being sent? So there can be frustrations, smile and work with what you got, try and change it as best you can, but certainly language on what is a reservist. At one organization, we were able to take reservists and it's like, oh my goodness, this person's got marketing experience in the real world because they're a reservist, right? And they've got Air Force experience. How great, let's get them on the team. And then you go to a different organization, you're like, all right, we'd like to extend them for one more year. And they're like, we're not gonna support that. And it's like, well, why not? Well, because they're only a backfill for active duty people. And you're like, did you miss the 2018 National Security Strategy Summary that says we're supposed to adopt best practices from business? Yeah, 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 we hear that beam. And, you know, maybe they're going to work on some waivers. But today the rule is, you know, you want to try and push for waivers. And you want to... So language matters. Models in your mind matters. The game matters. And we'll talk a little bit more about the decision-making and resourcing waiver approach in just a little bit. One last time, because I remember I was driving home from the Air Force Academy Department of Management when I heard the announcement, Apple is announced, they'll be changing their name from Apple Computer to Apple. And you're like, whoa. And then you look up the press and this is Steve Jobs, 2007. The Mac, iPod, Apple TV, iPhone, only one of those is a computer. So we're changing the name. How deep was Steve thinking? Where he's like, if I keep it Apple computer, maybe people are going to think the Mac is where it's at and we're not going to put all of our right energy into the iPod or the iPhone. You know, so there's, there's a lot going on. Watch your language and be careful. Because I just really enjoy this quote from Gaping Boyd's setup. Everybody says they want something worth fighting for, but then you actually get into the verbal knife fights over this. What is a reservist? What isn't? And the, your faith can be tested. It's like, are you going to stick with this? It's huge. All right, so you've got your culture, mission, strategy, and response to the environment that's about you, whether it's Pentagon leadership, frontline, at a base, wherever you're at, maybe in your research center. Now you have to work on your different structures. And so we're getting into almost a tactical level. So I, I don't want to go too specific with AFWorks other than to say, when I was briefing congressional staffers, this kind of chart worked really well for us because instead of calling it supply and demand, which most people are familiar with at least the broad concept, we would flip it around and say, innovation is about demand and supply. We do all sorts of things to uncover demand. And in our case, we have Spark Tank, we have base level Spark Cells, we do virtual tools, uh, website competitions, our major commands, so our different divisions. There's all sorts of ways that we uncover demand and then we supply solutions. And so 
The big takeaway here for reducing uncertainty in a congressional staffer's mind is to say, how can you give them something they're comfortable with so that they can be like, oh yeah, I believe in that innovation mission because this chart actually came in response to, I had to go over and brief over at Congress to the staffer on, you know what, Beam, there's like 30 different government innovation groups out there. Why should we keep AFWorks funded? Mission was successful. That was about a year and a half in, but demand and supply, I, I would state that's a useful paradigm to consider for your water pool. If you really want to get into the nitty gritty of how AFWorks did what they did during their startup years, you can go on your web browser and you can type the AFWorks book PDF and it should take you to the website. Sometimes it's afworkswill.af.mil, sometimes it's afworks.com. Uh, websites change and I'm no longer with the fine organization, but if you still can't find it and you're interested, there is 20 different authors at least who all gave contributions between years two and three on what it is that they were doing within their structure. Best insights, lessons learned, uh, I think a really great resource and really proud of what they all did. To, to leave this behind for other people to reflect and consider. So the AFWords book, you can find it. And if you can't, find me on LinkedIn. I will send you a copy. Now, as we make our way into the structure, we're down to, so what are you putting within that structure? And ladies and gentlemen, your number one resource in the innovation mission, not surprising, it's gonna be your people. And within AFWorks during our time, we referred to ourselves as the common mind because like the miracle that you are right now, you probably didn't just sit down and start thinking about, oh, did I breathe? Did I not breathe? You probably didn't sit and say, am I balanced? Am I? Things are magically happening all the time that make the holistic thing that is you happen. And we felt the same way about afterwards. It wasn't like, hey, let's wait for Beam to tell us what we're allowed to do. No, that wasn't the environment that we built. We built the, there's this whole common mind and there's all this stuff out there Let's go at it, you know, and we did come together for like the monthly briefing to the vice chief or we had our uh, common mind meetings and stuff like that. So there was there was definitely times when we were very much together, but there was a lot of decentralized execution just following some innovation principles. And you can find those back in our AFWorks book that I spoke of earlier. But again, it comes back to the people and our common mind. To give you one other model, let's look at Maslow again real quickly. because it's from Maslow that we see to get to your highest self or the most cultivated self of self-actualization, the, thank you for putting in the link, Trish, <laughs> that, that you will have to climb up. Again, if you're dropped in the jungle, what are you worried about? Well, first you're worried about uh, food, clothing, and shelter. So even though you might wanna take a nap, you gotta find the river and you gotta find the source of food. And if there's a saber-toothed tiger blocking it, you're gonna have to take out the tiger because you know you need food, clothing, and shelter. After that, you can climb up and say, hmm, I'm going to worry about my safety now. You find the cave, you build your fence, whatever you're trying to do to do that. And eventually, then you try and find fellow beings who can support your adventure, belonging, love, esteem within the group, all that. And some people like one or two close friends, some people like a thousand just fun, uh, extra, extraneous, all good. Where's my energy coming from? Everybody has their choices. But in the end, what we're trying to do is we're trying to self-actualize and saying, wow, I'm trying to reach my highest level of fulfillment? That feels a little challenging. But I would say to you, that was the AFWorks, that was like our internal secret ingredient once we got into our major inputs of people. And it was because we were able to do self-actualization with the following working definition. You self-actualize when you use your strength towards meaningful work. And that creates the fulfillment for you. So you got the happiness, purpose, fulfillment triangle here that we say, target the triangle. Quick example, a golfer, Tiger Woods, as awesome as his golfing skill was, you would not throw him into American NFL football. He would be crushed, right? It's just not his thing. So you can have all sorts of skill, but again, going back to our flow model, if you're in the wrong environment with all sorts of skill, you're going to get crushed. Same way the NFL football player doesn't want to go one-on-one -on -one against Tiger on a golf course because they're going to look like an idiot, like big muscle-bound buffoons while this guy with motor skills is just making them look silly. So if you're not happy where you're at, it may have zero to do with your skill set. It might just be, oh, I'm not in the right organization. I like abstract thinking, and this is an accounting cheat or something to that effect. So really important that you align all of those factors so that your will, your determination, your commitment can be at its strongest, and that's what the flow model tries to guide us. 
Now, at the end of the day then, just like you said, um, the last layer that you see added into the flow model is this idea of getting feedback and output. You know, you, you do your best effort. How's it working? Do people say, yes, that was really great. Thanks for doing that. Or are people like, mm, I don't know about you. So we have to look at that stuff very carefully and then decide if we're in the right environment, if we need to add more skills to our toolkit, whatever that is. But the great part is if you're an organizational leader and you're trying to optimize all this stuff, like the 80% opening answer is just to turn around and say, ask your people. So on the right-hand side of the model, we have a model that comes, well, from where I'm at now at tier one, the performance factors model that says, we believe that people are at the center of everything. And so if we examine and analyze in partnership with our people, and we work our way out through the roles, relationships, and the overall organization, strategy, mission, culture, and then the world environment that's out there, we believe we can uncover a lot of things that will advance you. So it's pretty cool. And I just give thanks that I ended up in an organization that allowed the flow model that absolutely works with the performance factors model. So there's a nice yin yang here, depending on which side of the coin, if you wanna go from the outside in or the inside out, but just multiple sources that reflect, hey, like Maslow, there are some models we should consider that'll help us win at this game. I had mentioned earlier that we'll get back to waivers. Why waivers? Because some people during my three years in AFWorks in particular were like, Beam, I don't know if I want to sponsor an innovation mission for a while. I, I'm not a very innovative kind of person. So I mm, aren't I supposed to be the thought leader if I'm the leader? And it'd be like, ma'am, sir, take it easy. Let's try this one. Here's an example from Edwards Air Force Base, home of the right stuff, home of the breaking of the sound barrier, where the general of the base, uh, Eddie the Dragon, Tyker, see the far left screen, uh, said, you know what? Here's one of the most innovative things I can do right now is I can just say, hey, people, how can we get out of your way? How much bureaucracy exists from the 1960s and 1970s that we don't still need that at the space? We've moved on or we've got faster digital processes or what can we do to make your world more agile? And so the dragon went all in. On the left, you see he made swag to support this. This is a movement. And then as he was launching his innovation campaign, it included things like without ever demonizing a person or an office, caricature stuff like the abominable no man. No, 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 right? You know, and these pictures, these caricatures, we were able to take these culture graphics. They were in the chow hall. Those were um, tiles that were placed on the wall. There was some door hanger stuff like you'd find at a hotel, do not disturb. The innovation team at Edwards would like put these on different doors on a Wednesday night. And so Thursday, that'd be a bit of a talk like what the, you know, but you set up the conversation in a non-threatening way. How do we advance the environment? That was pretty cool. And so the dragon, then that summer, I remember he held his summer of waivers and he was given 96 different requests and he was able to waive 92 of them. So if you're a leader out there and you're wondering, I'm not that innovative, hey, try the easier one of what can I waive for you or what can I pursue as a priority waiver? And it was so successful then that they started on the winner of waivers and the rest is history. You can reach out to Edwards for that. And one other item, an easygoing model to consider is, let's never say that innovation is the answer to everything because it's just not true. We have this spectrum here and on the far left, you would say, sometimes I don't wanna see innovation. Sometimes I wanna know that there's a plan and we're gonna try the plan and if the plan isn't working, we're gonna step away. We've got our unity of effort. Open heart surgery, probably not the time to see people just doing random things because they never thought of it before. Probably more likely that if something isn't going right, maybe we close up and reconvene with our experts before we go at this again. Firefighting, combat, there are all sorts of situations where you have a common mind going in and you don't want to deviate much from the plan. Uh, but are there instances, such as on the right-hand side of our spectrum, where we say, you know what, there's, there's probably some room for some low-risk experimentation out here. And by far, one of the most famous stories is the post-it note, where Spencer Silver was worried about ruining those church hymnals when he would sing at choir practice he's like, oh, I got a dog ear the page. I hate ruining the books. What if I invent a glue that doesn't stick? I put it on the paper, then I can put it in the hymnal, and I can pull it off. At hey, look at that. And it, it doesn't ruin the pages anymore. So it took a while. But the environment that 3M built for Spencer was a policy that was laboratory scientists. Whatever you're interested in, take 15% of your time and work on it. And you have to find something useful. Maybe we can do patents together and all sorts of support for just independent innovation, low-risk stuff. You didn't put all the, the company eggs weren't in one basket. 
Spencer and then program manager Art Fry get together. They they um, launch it in Denver, three other cities. It's not the most positive launch. And we're not going to say that they're going to say throw it out, but uh, year one wasn't uh, uh, gangbusters. And so they ended up going back in year two to Idaho, and then the rest becomes history. But I think it's important to note that, again, even within an innovation environment, those first things coming out of there may not be the ones that like, whoa. So, hey, welcome to the uncertainty. There will always be some uncertainty. But while innovation is uncertain, there are ways to stack the odds, such as through the models and the environments that we've been investigating. And so I just saw this one recently on LinkedIn. So to Jay and the AFWorks group and the Sparks that are out there that, you know, you make it such a priority that there are now actually painted parking lots for the innovators. That's where we need because it starts with the people. So that's just beautiful and I wanted to highlight it. If you're interested, in seeing how these principles applied. I've given you Kodak, I've given you Blockbuster. We've done some global history with Korea. Uh, the deeper journey is I'm trying to leave behind a book so that people can go after it. Uh, the experiment that succeeded, which Trish already mentioned. And note, it's not beams, omniscience in action. Just not true. We had a bunch of experimental ideas based upon kind of a Maslow idea of whatever you're best at, thanks for joining the mission, try and do something that helps us with innovation. And it was amazing by creating that kind of environment and supporting it that we were able to accomplish what we did. So um, you can find out different principles, learn more about the flow model, different examples besides what we've mentioned here in today's gathering and all those graphics that you see as well. Uh, and I'd like to say, you know, at some level it is so simple a caveman could do it and you can bring together all these different ideas and create your own impact. But as Trish mentioned, <laughs> that yeah, it can be a little challenging at times too. So. Um, the original title for the book was, you know, Juggling Chainsaws While Tightrope Walking Through a Storm, because there are so many ways that things can go wrong. But you'll note that our tightrope walker is also smiling at the end because you can see the rainbows and you know you're going to get out of the clouds. Again, going back to Maslow or our working definition, you know, you are approaching your self-actualization or your highest potential when you've uncovered your strengths and you're able to apply it towards meaningful work and that leaves a fulfilling effect. This slide could be an entire discussion by itself, but the simple point is, with our two minute warning blinking, our simple point is that it is through innovation that world prosperity was able to take off and that was through policy. So perhaps the additional lunch and learn, we could reach out and talk. But if I had to leave you then with one final thought about innovation, this one's not a model. This is another, you can web search this one. We have with us Silent Cal, President Calvin Coolidge, who laid out how do you innovate or how do you be most effective? Why was he called Silent Cal? Because he was such a quiet type of person that one evening at a dinner party, the person sitting next to him was like, Mr. President, I bet $50 that I could get you to say more than two, two words at tonight's dinner. Silent Cal looks back at him and says, you lose. Turns out, right, so he's a man of few words, but this stoic put out the following thought with regard to persistence in pursuing the factors linking organizational willpower or persistence. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. The world, nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is nearly a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Those, the slogan press on has solved and always will solve the problems of humankind. So I encourage you to persist. I encourage you to think differently and to slay consistently those dragons that are out there. Because whether it's the Trojan horse or Washington crossing the Delaware, it was through different thinking and not just a new widget that the world and the world history has changed. So I thank Def for allowing me to have this opportunity to share these ideas with you. I thank you for what you do to bring things together. And I turn it back over to you, Trish. Oh my gosh, Bean. Slay all day hashtag uh, has just taken on a new meeting. Uh, 
Well, oh, gosh, what a great way to end the day. But we're not ending yet because we still have some questions from our amazing audience. The first one I've just dropped in to the chat. I'll read it out. Um, how does an innovation organization balance top-down direction, such as selecting certain technologies like AI to pursue with bottom-up feedback, such as warfighter or exercise after action reports from Patrick Collins? Patrick Collins, a fantastic question. Uh, one way, and this is uh, funny and both brutal in an economic but historically accurate sense, one way that you can tell where the priority is, who's willing to pay for your people's time. And, and it's like you will, because in AFWorks, we started with five people and we grew to a core of 30. Then with volunteers, you could say we grew to 130 by our third year. But meanwhile, we united 60,000 people through a virtual database. So number one, there's all sorts of ways that you can do the frontline stuff through volunteerism while at the same time supporting what your senior leaders want. For example, within AFWorks, we had an annual event called the Fusion Event, and that was directly the second most powerful general in the Air Force, uh, Vice Chief Stephen Wilson, Sevy Wilson, was my direct report for AFWorks operations. And once a year, he said, can we do something on perimeter security and drones or AI? Or And so we had one event that was absolutely devoted to the senior leaders because there was money carved out for it. But at the front line, within, uh, during our startup years, we went from one to 70 Air Force bases. So now you have the front line and the front line people were able to go to their base commanders and say, because Air Force, we weren't kingmakers and we were very deliberate about not having the budget to be a kingmaker or a queen maker of a project. And it was, if your idea is good enough, someone will fund it. And so on the one hand, that sounds incredibly brutal, but on the other hand, it really makes you go learn, how does that work? Go watch Shark Tank. Go learn the problem. It's the 30-second elevator pitch. Problem, your instant solution, and how that will create a better history. When you learn that three-step process and you teach it to people and it grows in the innovation minds and stuff. So you don't have to balance uh, one versus the other, the senior leader versus the front line. But in both situations, you need to have a consistent, are you able to solve the problem and are you willing to put money behind it because the idea is that compelling? So it's idea refinement. Uh, that will enhance the balance that you are seeking. Over. All right. Well, I'm going to toss a question into the hopper. Uh -huh. um, so I know when I first got connected with the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum back in 2018, I felt like, oh, the word, you know, the scales have fallen from my eyes. There are words that actually reflect the things that I've been thinking and feeling. So if you could beam <laughs> back in time to talk to a younger version of beam, maybe when you weren't thinking, you know, innovation or those weren't the words in your fluency, you know, if you kind of had DNA of an innovator, but maybe not the words or the structure of an innovator, mm -hmm. what kind of encouragement would you give to yourself or to someone that mm -hmm. finds themselves in the like, oh, finally, people get me? You know, mm -hmm. what kind of encouragement could you give yourself at that stage? That is a fantastic question. If Beam had the time machine and went back and talked to younger Beam, I would have sat down and in the opening 30 seconds, I would have said, Thomas Edison, ever hear of him? Well, he was pursuing the light bulb. It was not, some people say it was a thousand, but you can actually find the journal entries, and I'd have to go back and find the source, that he spent over 3,000 different thought experiments or physical experiments in pursuit of the light bulb. So the first thing I would say is you need to be thinking with an experimental mindset, and it's just, it's just you're going to have a lot of things that don't work out like you planned, but like any good scientist, take that. And just like Edison said when he was last, you know, you've got all these failures. He's like, failures? No, I've got all this thing that says, don't go over here, go over here. He's like, that's, that's guidance. So that mindset of an experimental mindset, that's just about everything. And then the one other, two other, the, the first one is that you want to speak in terms of net benefit. Because when you experiment, if you get, let's, let's use an email for an example. If I send out 100 emails that says, who can help me with X, and I get back 10 answers, that's a 90% failure rate by one mindset. But compared to zero, when we started the effort, I've got 10 answers and 10 leads that I can go with. So the net benefit is compared to zero, I've got 10 wins, here we go. Even though if I were to look in the column of wins versus losses, it's 10 to 90 and I'm losing, but it actually is an overall net benefit. So knowing the term net benefit and how you can explain, we're going to innovate, we're going to have all sorts of things that aren't going to work out. 
but the big winds are going to take it all the way through. And then the last expression would be think big, start small, and I'll even I'll, I'll throw in the word fail cheap, learn fast, win big at scale. And because leaders, again, going back to net benefit and experimenting, anybody can think big. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Start with small experiments. When the failures come or non-successes and learning opportunities, learn quick from these cheap things because you didn't put a whole lot of time into it. Your ego isn't tied to it. Pivot. Go to the next experiment so that you can win big at scale. That five minutes would have probably saved Beam a lot of messaging. We got much better with time and reading and collectively our minds as we worked on that. But uh, those would be my three things. Yeah. Okay, that's amazing. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to. Um, you know, kind of like overwhelm the system and ask yet another question. But um, do want to just really thank you from the bottom of my heart, Beam. You know, like listening to this whole process that you explained, I was like, you know, all all of my uh, you know mental fireworks were going off. In fact, uh, our director of operations, Heather Alvarado, dropped in uh, the Slack room that they're like, hey, Dr. Beam is speaking my language. So you know, I know that you've resonated quite a bit. And one of the things that um, really kind of sat with me while you were going through your slides is how valuable it is that, um, you know, in your work, you've taken the time to capture your thoughts into more than just one conversation between two people so that more people can benefit from it and reflect upon it. And really from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you so much for the work you've done, for the work that you're doing and for being with us here today. So I thank, thank you, you, my friend. And I thank you for all the brainstorming sessions that we've had and, and the support that DEF has had to bring together our innovators through so many different connections. It's, it's an honor to be here and continue to contribute to the mission. Absolutely. Thank you, Beam. So um, now as the community team lead, I have the great segue opportunity to talk about the next conference that we're going to have for the annual conference. Um, you know, as much as many of you know, we were very um, sad to have to, you know, make a decision a few weeks ago to not have this in person after we had, you know, longed for that. Uh, through 2020. Uh, we were not able to meet in person as a large group this year. But next year, we are planning on doing just that. And drum roll. Uh, the next host for the Deaf Annual Conference will be uh, located at a location not near us in Washington, D.C. And if you're taking a look at your screen right now and you are good at geography, you may be able to see where uh, this amazing stuff is going down and where our next conference will be. You'll see some of the key organizers there on screen. And it is uh, really just a delight of my heart to announce that our next conference in person, finger crossed, will be in the uh, Greater Bay Area of Silicon Valley, San Francisco and San Jose, under the auspices of the Greater Bay uh, Deaf Agora. So congratulations to Richard Tippett and team, and we will see you next year in Northern California. Mike, over to you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, it is it is exciting to be able to uh, look ahead a year to where we're going to meet up next. Uh, and I hope that uh, all of us will be able to be there together in person, just like you said, Trish. So thanks for that. There are a lot of good agoras, a lot of good locations. I will continue to uh, alternate between them uh, throughout the years. We'll be back in D.C. again in the future. But really looking forward to um, getting some West Coast time uh, into the Bay Area. So uh, it's it is already somehow time to start wrapping up uh, DEF 2021. You plan these things for a long time and then they go by in a flash. Um, and as, as I look to do that, I, I think about the last two years and where we've been and, and where we've come. And if you just think about uh, in terms of membership growth, when I think about our members, we've grown by over 3,400 members in the last two years. And we've had new Agoras or chapters launch all over the country from Silicon Slopes outside Salt Lake City to Champaign-Urbana, from Dallas-Fort Worth to Newport, Rhode Island. We've had new lines of programming launched by our very own members out of ideas from their heads, like Cornerstones, 
and new communities within DEF that have spun out to become their own vibrant communities like Agitare. And I'm also excited to share that we uh, have started seeking nonprofit certifications from organizations like uh, Charity Navigator and GuideStar, and that we've recently been awarded the Gold Transparency Certificate uh, from GuideStar, which rec uh, represents a big milestone for our operations and uh, for us as a 501c3 that, uh, that individuals and organizations can donate to. And when I think about all these things and the milestones and the, and the change of the last two years, the overwhelming emotion is uh, certainly gratitude. And so I'd like to do some thank yous before we close out today. Uh, I'd like to thank once again, our sponsors and our partners. I've mentioned them a couple of times, but I wanna mention them again, the, both the returning and the new sponsors from JJR Solutions to NSTXL, NOAI and Rebellion Defense, BMNT, German American Bank, Leaf Software Solutions, Lifeline Data Centers, Techimax, Anderol, WeWork, BetterUp, ATS Communications. These are amazing names to have in our corner. And all of these organizations and companies care about the mission uh, that all of us are on as, as members of the deaf community. We also have partners that contribute um, tons of benefits to our members from human intelligence to Decode, Second Front Systems, Hacking for Defense, Google, the Boone Group, William & Mary University, and the National Contract Management Association. These collaboration partners are, again, amazing names to have in our corner. And in terms of other thank yous, there's there are still many others. I'd like to thank uh, Audion LLC. They're our virtual production company, the crew that has put together this virtual event. Um, you can't see it, but they're running green rooms and Zoom and bringing in speakers. They're running tech rehearsals, uploading slides. They're running those lower thirds, those banners across the bottom of the screen to introduce folks. They really turn this into a well-produced live stream that you're enjoying right now. And it's been great to work with them for a second year in a row. That's Audion LLC. I highly recommend them if you ever need conferencing help. Uh, I'd like to spotlight Christian, Christian Kaman, who built out the beautiful web pages and private portals that we've been using for the conference. And I'd like to thank our staff, Heather Alvarado and Laura Stegman, and our conference volunteers, which include among many Sergio Rodriguez and Chow Nguyen. Chow really has led this effort for months. And if you've had the uh, pleasure of meeting him yet, you'll know he has an incredibly sunny disposition, which is infectious uh, to all of us on the team. And he was actually very new to DEF when he stepped up to this role. So it's really, really impressive. And we're really grateful for all the work he's put in. And, uh, and there are a ton of volunteers. There are so, so many. So I could, I could go on for a long time. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention at this point, too, that we are also always recruiting for new volunteers. If you care about this community, about this mission, we've got all manner and types of ways that you can contribute, uh, contribute time or your, your skills or your background. So please reach out to us. There are uh, opportunities on the website at def.org to volunteer. And so when I think about this team, I think about all these people, um, I will miss them tremendously. And I say miss because it has come time to announce the next executive director of the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum. It has been um, truly, and I mean this, an honor and a privilege to serve in this role for the last two years. The community and its people have had an immense impact on me personally and professionally uh, ever since Steph started in 2013. Uh, and in this role, I know I've certainly grown. I've learned a tremendous amount from our team and our members. Uh, the role, if you, if you don't know, is a two-year tenure. So as we approached uh, DEF 2021, we ran a thorough process to uh, solicit nominations and to conduct interviews. We had interviews with a panel of DEF volunteers and staff and members, and we had interviews with our board of directors. And I'm really proud that we had six amazing humans nominated uh, and that we forwarded two incredible women leaders as finalists to our board of directors. Uh, and therefore, without further ado, and some of you may have put this together, uh, but it is my pleasure to share with you today that the next and fifth executive director of DEF is our very own Trisha Martinelli here on screen with me. And Trisha has been serving for, oh, <laughs> I'm going to high five the wrong direction. I know it. <laughs> Trish has been serving for a long time on the volunteer team uh, at the national level with our community and our Agoras. I know she is truly well known and respected throughout our community. And she has a thorough understanding of where DEF has been and where DEF is today. And even more importantly, she has a vision for where DEF needs to go tomorrow. She has her own incredible story of what DEF has meant to her. And I know she cares deeply and passionately about this mission, about its people and about our community. So I feel really good about entrusting those three things to her to pass the torch as it were. Uh, and once again, my final word would just be thank you for the chance to serve. Uh, and to be in this good fight alongside all of you. So now over to Trish, your final words, uh, and close us out for DEF 2021. 
Well, Michael, thank you so much for that. And I remember the moment when you were announced as executive director and I was like, wow, I really need to get to know this guy. He must really be uh, totally awesome if uh, the whole organization has been turned over to uh, Mike Madrid. And I was not wrong. I, I didn't know you then, but I got to watch you over the next couple of years, and I could definitely 100% see why you were selected, why um, among all of the great innovators that we have in our fold, you were the one that um, were entrusted with uh, what we were doing. So thank you so much, Michael, for your leadership, your friendship, your mentorship, um, your butt kickingness when I needed it, and all of the good things that have come along with us working together. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I think in military parlance, you know, I think the phrase would be all remaining policies remain in effect and, you know, uh, see you at the next uh, formation. Uh, but I, I think I owe a little bit more to the community um, to just say that this is um, more than just a, um, a mission that we undertake. It's very much a passion. Uh, when I became involved with DEF, it was um, just what was needed at a time in which professionally um, I was told that I could just keep that innovation stuff in a box, okay, because it wasn't needed here. So um, for all the people that need to find the members of their uh, extended constellation, as we heard in military mentors earlier today, um, you have found our constellation, and uh, we look forward to and both learning from you and serving with you uh, moving forward. And with that, I would say let the afternoon parties begin. And um, thank you once again for attending our annual conference.